Good morning, EAC family, friends, visitors, those of you who are watching online. My name is Jay, and I'm uh, privileged to be one of the elders here at EAC. Um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, my wife heard I was preaching, and she signed up for the nursery. Um, <laughs> Now, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, the last Sunday of 2021, and uh, next week, 2022 is coming. And I don't know about you, but I love new beginnings. I love new starts. I, I love every morning. I, that's why I like to wake up before the sun rises to watch it rise because it's a new beginning. But there's something special about a new year starting up. It's a time for us to try to make a new start in our lives. And, and that's why a lot of people do... Um, New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to make myself stronger, better, uh, lose weight, eat healthier, all those types of things. But as we reflect on, on 2021, before going into 2022, we're going to reflect and we're going to think about all the things of last year. And uh, maybe I ate too much last year, so this year I'm going to eat less, right? But there's a lot of wonderful things that God has done in 2021. I mean, there's, there's, God has blessed this church, has blessed many of you. Uh, there's been a lot going on, but there's also a lot of pain that's happened in 2021. A lot of suffering, even within my circle of folks and friends and people here at church, there's so much pain and there's so much suffering, and I've got good news for you. In 2022, there's going to be more of the same, amen? Now you're wondering why you came to church this morning. There will be. We live in a sin-cursed world. And I wish that I could to tell you that living a Christian life was a bed of roses, but it's not. There are going to be some tough times. There's going to be storms. And, and as somebody stands up here and they prepare for a message like I did and like Connor does and other people do, as a preachers across America and across the world stand in front of a group of people, if they're honest preachers, they want to try to make a difference. They want to try to come motivate believers. They want to try to come and, 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 and make a difference in people's lives. But a lot of times, what the preacher is communicating and trying to motivate the believers to and the reality of where people are living, there's a gap. And in that gap, the one thing that hinders is pain. This kid comes into the store one time, and he, he, he throws some uh, laundry detergent up on the countertop, and the clerk looks at this 10-year-old boy and says, ah, I see your mother's got you to do some shopping for today, does she? He said, no, nah, that's not for my mom. That's for me. I'm going to wash the dog. He says, son, that's laundry detergent. You can't wash the dog. He goes, I know. That's what I like to use. I've used it before. I'm going to use it again. I'll show you. About three days later, the same kid comes into the same store, and that clerk remembers that conversation and looks at the little boy and says, he, he had to ask, son, about three days ago, you were in here, and you bought some laundry detergent. You said you were going to wash the dog. Now, how did that turn out? He said, well, the dog's dead. See, son, I told you you can't use laundry detergent to wash a dog. He said, no, it wasn't laundry detergent and got him. It was a spin cycle. Listen, I've been in my places in my Christian life, and I know you have too, where you're just like, thank you, Lord, for cleansing me. Thank you for washing me. But this spin cycle is about to kill me. Anybody been there? So what do you do when you have trials that come into your life as a Christian? I want to bring you a message this morning. I don't think James would have probably entitled his message this way, but I believe it gets the essence of what he's trying to get across in, this, in, in these verses, and, and that is how to keep a lemonade perspective on the lemons in your life. Because they say when life hands you lemons, you make verse, uh, uh, James chapter 1. If you got your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. James chapter 1, we'll go through verses 2 through 4. He says, my brethren. Now, some of your translations may say my brothers and sisters, uh, but he wouldn't say brothers or brethren or sisters if they weren't believers in Jesus Christ. If anyone ever tells you that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not going to suffer hard times, they're lying to you. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy when... You fall into various trials. Now, let's make a couple observations here real quick before we move forward. It is important to God, more important to God, how you go through something than what you go through. It is ever important to God the character in, with, in, with, in which we emerge from when we go through trials. So James is trying to set us up to understand that is, an, it, that is what's most important to God. Now, here's what we often do as believers. 
We often use the word joy and happiness interchangeably, and we get him confused. He didn't say, be happy when you fall in the trials. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? Happy? I mean, think, you got to be careful of these people that run around singing. You, you may remember the old song, I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. I mean, are you serious? Happy all the time? That's craziness. They ought to be singing, I'm in right, up right, down right, lying to you all the time, right? <laughs> happy all the time. Do you come from the same planet that I do? We can't be happy all the time. Matter of fact, happiness has more to do with your circumstances, and joy has more to do with your Christian character. Happiness is largely based upon what's going on around you. As a matter of fact, happiness comes from the word happenings. So if your happenings happen to be happening happily, then you're happy. But if your happenings happen not to be happening happily, then you're not happy. It took me a long time to get that. Come on, laugh with me. <laughs> As a matter of fact, well, let's just go back to the verse. It says, my brothers... Consider it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, when you fall into variegated trials of all kinds. This happiness is, is, is an emotion that's based upon a reaction to circumstances where joy is a, is a response regardless of how you feel or what your circumstances are. It's far deeper in my book. And it goes on. It says, count all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, perseverance, endurance, but let patience, perseverance, endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete. That is mature and complete. And I love this last line. Be real careful here. It says, lacking nothing. So how in the world do you keep a lemonade perspective on the lemons in your life in 2022? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to adjust your expectation. Say that with me. Adjust your expectations. One more time. Adjust your expectation. And that point is derived from one observation, one word in verse 2, and it's where he says, my brethren, count it all joy if. No, he says, when. He didn't say if you fall into various trials. He said when you fall into various trials. He's trying to adjust our expectations for us because there is a, there is a myth-hood, there is a, a myth, a falsehood, a, a heresy that's been working its way, way through the ranks of every generation, and it's basically this. If, if you're living right, then things will go smoothly because it has the blessings of God on it. But if things are going badly, it's because you've messed up, you've fouled up, and you're being punished, and that is absolutely not the case. And as long as we believe that, we're going to be some of the most disappointed Christians on the planet, and our testimonies will be tainted as a result. It, it, several years ago, I, I left active duty military and I went into full-time youth ministry. I took about a 50% pay cut. So before leaving the military, I sold our second vehicle. It was a restored 72 Ford Bronco. I love that vehicle. I spent a lot of blood and sweat in building that thing. But we needed the extra cash, so we sold it and we tried to live on a one-car family. And it was difficult, as you can imagine. And it didn't take long before we realized this is not quite working out. So my pastor, he also recognized it. He came and he said, listen, I, I just say no if you don't want it, but I, I got this old Buick Century. It's got 250-some thousand miles on it. And, but if you, if you want it, it's yours. I said, I'll take it. He said, got some mechanical problems. I'll take it. So I took that old vehicle, and as you can imagine, with an old car with that many miles on it, this thing broke down all the time. But I was pretty mechanically inclined, so I kept some tools and some rags. If you've ever worked on an old car, you know the deal. You better have some cleaning stuff and some rags because you're going to get nasty and greasy. But here's what the amazing part is. I noticed a big difference in my attitude depending on where I was going when that car broke down. I mean, you see, if I, if I was going somewhere to get a gallon of milk or something personal or, or, you know, just visit some friends, I felt like I was on my time. But let me tell you something. If I, if I was going uh, to church to preach or, or to, to execute a youth event, man, I was an ambassador for the Lord, anointed servant of Jesus Christ, going to do ministry. And here's what the amazing part is. If I broke down in, 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 in that car in my own time, going to do something personal, man, I'd stop, I'd get out, I'd get my tools, get some rags, I'd fix whatever was broken, I would move on. But if I broke down, man, if I was broke down on my nice clothes on the way to do ministry, you want to see a youth pastor in the flesh. <laughs> I mean, throwing a hoot nanny fit and, 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 and on my way to do ministry. 
Because I had this expectation, this subconscious thought in theology that if, when I was on my way to, to preach or on my way to serve or on my way to counsel or to teach or to motivate believers that somehow I was supposed to be afforded some sort of divine protection from stuff like that. There's a psychological phenomenon, and for the lack of a better word, I use the word psychological. And it's this. This is what James is trying to get across to us. When we expect life to happen at a level nine, but it happens at a level five, we're disappointed to a level two. And this is why there are some of the, Chris is some of the most disappointed people on the planet because we believe things ought to go better because we're in Jesus. You expect life to happen at a nine, it happens at a five, you're disappointed at a two, but check this out. If you expect life to happen at a level five and it happens at a level five, man, we rejoice to a level nine because at least we got what we expected. This is, this is literally a verifiable phenomenon. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. And it was named after Admiral Jim Stockdale who was the highest ranking officer in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam. Seven years he spent being tortured in that prison. And after he got out, he was interviewed by a man named Jim Scott, wrote the book, Good to Great, among others. And, and, and Jim Collins, Jim Collins asked him, he said this, he said, how did you survive that ordeal? For seven years, how did you make it through when so many others didn't? And this is what he said. He said, I made it through by rejecting optimism. He said, what do you mean? He goes, let me tell you about the people who didn't make it through. Those who didn't make it through were the ones who said, we're going to be rescued by Christmas. We're going to be out by Christmas. We're going to be home by Christmas. And Christmas came, and another, and another. And he said they died of a broken heart. Admiral Stockdale said that, I knew by faith. I, I always knew in my heart that I would be rescued. He said, I, I, I just imagine I could see myself afterwards traveling the world, teaching people and telling people about the stories of being there and how it built my character and how it made me stronger. And, and I, I, I just, I knew it was going to happen. I just did not know when. And the ones who died were the ones who were the optimists. The ones who survived were the ones who ruthlessly embraced their reality. When Joel Olstein stands in front of a crowd of 10,000 people like he did a few a while back, I saw this thing on TV, I was shocked. But he stood in this huge crowd of people and he said, just say to yourself out loud, tell yourself, this is my year of physical healing. This is my year of getting ahead. This is my year of financial abundance. This is my year of getting a promotion. And then it doesn't happen. These people bail out on God because they've been dead, led down a lie. The Bible says, count all joy when? You fall into all kinds of trials and temptations. Peter says, don't be surprised as if something strange is happening to you when you're undergoing all kinds of trials. Something strange is happening to you. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Jesus said that I know it. it's in red ink. But I still hear people say this, oh brother, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have my quiet time in the morning to help my day go better. What happens when you have your quiet time in the morning, your day just falls apart? How about we have our quiet time in the morning so it helps us go through the day better regardless of what happens in the day? We gotta adjust our expectations. He said, when, not if. The second thing we need to do, if we wanna have 2022 where we go through these trials and struggles, which we will, and we wanna come out stronger, is we have to realize that the pain is always productive. The pain is always productive. Look at uh, verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces. Now, I want to focus in on that word knowing for just a minute. I believe that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this word is just as important as every other word. It's just as strategic because he says, knowing this. Every time God says, know this, pay attention because what you know determines how you go. He's always, God is always trying to correct our response by correcting our beliefs, and, and, and our beliefs determine our behavior. We act like what we live like we live because we believe what, like we believe. Jesus said, if you want to you be set free, this is how you do it. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So when he says, know this, it's so important. If you don't know this, you're going to react instead of respond to circumstances. If you don't know this, you're not going to weather the storm. If you don't know this, when the trial comes, you'll lose your testimony and your faith. So he said, know this, that the testing of your faith 
produces. I want to stop there for a moment because I believe this is really liberating because there's probably folks in here right now that's wondering, why on earth am I going through what I'm going through? Or maybe you just got out of one and you just said, why did I go through that time? I'm just telling you, God might have you in the furnace, but he's got his eye on the thermometer, his hand on the thermostat. And he's designed it and allowed it by his sovereign love and grace because he's going to produce something in your life that could not be produced any other way. Knowing that the testing of your faith, there is something, there's something there while you're in that furnace, while you're on that trial, in that trial that you just don't see. There's a bigger picture in the mind of God. God is working, I promise you. If you're a believer and you're going through hard times, God is doing something. He's producing something. You have to know this. You know, Pastor Connor stood up here a few months ago and told a short story about Hugh Halter. Some of you know the name. He wrote several books. We, we're actually, as a church, going through some of his material on missional communities. But Hugh Halter, when he was young, he had a call to ministry. He had a call to go into pastoral ministry. And he went to school, and he studied, and he had plans, and he thought his future was set serving God in this, in this manner of, of, of a pastoral ministry. But then he realized that he couldn't do what God was calling him to do because he had a special needs child that consumed all of his time. He couldn't leave home long enough to be out doing pastoral ministry. And, and, and I'm using this, it's a, it's a pretty simple example because some of you read his books, but through that time, can you imagine having that kind of call on your life and, and knowing where you're gonna go to have it all turned upside down and the trial and the darkness and everything that's going on in his life saying, why Lord, why did you let me go to school to do this? Why did all this go on? There's a lot of questions. But God had a bigger picture in mind. Because because of that, Hugh now travels all over the country and he's done amazing work. He's done amazing ministry, teaching people on missional living. He's done, he's led many people to the Lord through the slow process of building trust and relationships through right there in his own home, in his own businesses. And, and God has just used him in a greater way. When it looks one way on the surface, something else is going on. God said, yes, there's a testing. And it looks like the devil's fingerprints on it, but it's been sifted through the hands of God for a purpose. I know it doesn't make sense, whatever you're going through, or whatever you went through, or whatever you're going to go through. When you're in it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's perplexing sometimes. We just don't understand what can God be doing. I, I know it's, it's typically the devil wants you to think that, he, that it's punishment for something because you've messed up. It even affects our self-esteem quite often, but there's a purpose in the mind and the heart of God, and his grace is not diminished in the storm. He said there's a testing. Now, don't go to the first definition of testing like I did when I read this verse. So I, don't, I don't like tests. Most of us don't like tests. Every, every, every night before I had a big test in school or college, I'd always pray this prayer. Now, Lord, lay me down to rest. Help me pass tomorrow's test. If I should die before I wake, well, that's one less test I'll have to take. <laughs> There's this guy, he was, he, he was driving down the road, he was dressed kind of funny, uh, and he gets pulled over for speeding. And the cop walks up to the door and looks at him, and he says, what, who, uh, why, why, why do you look like? He says, I, I work in a circus. That's why I'm dressed like this. He looks over in the floorboard of the passenger seat, and he sees three long neck beer bottles. The cop goes, yeah, uh-huh, sure, I, I know you've been drinking, get out of the car. He said, no, 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 seriously, I, 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 I'm a juggler. That's what I do. I, I juggle those bottles, bottles. I haven't been drinking them. You're going to have to prove it to me. Bring the bottles with you. So he gets out of the car. He's got those three long neck beer bottles. He said, okay, show me your stuff. So he starts juggling those bottles. Meanwhile, this middle-aged couple is driving down the road, and he looks over. They see what's going on. The husband looks at the wife and says, honey, i got to quit drinking. She said, why? Look at the test they're giving now. <laughs> we... <laughs> That's not the kind of test that James is talking about here. The word that James is using here for test comes from the word of metallurgy. And it describes what a silversmith or goldsmith or an ironsmith does when he takes the, the, the ore of his craft and he puts it into the furnace. That's the word, test, to place into the furnace. And you guys, have, you, you know how this works. You put the ore into the furnace and you turn up the heat. And then the heat starts making that ore get soft. And then all of a sudden, all the dross, all the compromised areas, all the impurities rise to the surface and separate out so it can be scooped away 
by the master thus purified. The furnace is then turned down and the gold or the, uh, the metal it exits the furnace. And watch this. What comes out is more pure and more beautiful and more usable than what went in. He said, don't you know that the furnace of trials, the furnace of temptations, the furnace of testing is producing something in you and, and, and it can't be produced any other way. You show me any silversmith or goldsmith or ironsmith, they put it into the, uh, into the furnace for three reasons and God does it for the same three reasons, to improve it. I'm sorry, to prove it, to test the metal, to improve it, to make it better than it was when it went in, and to approve it, to bring it to its fullest potential. So I, I believe in, in, in your life and in my life, for years, God will allow us to come and surround ourselves around propositional truth in Scripture. And he'll, he'll let us sing it, and he'll let us shout it, and he'll let us applaud it, and he'll let us amen it, but to a very real degree, I mean, it's my faith, but it's really mama's faith. It's, it's my faith, but it's really the pastor's faith. I mean, we've been sort of riding the coattails of those who taught us in Sunday school, riding the coattails of the, the, the grandma who taught, taught me at her knee. Then all of a sudden, God will, will, will bring us, after, after we have sung about it and, and, and after we have uh, shouted about it and after we've read about it and amened it and applauded it and been around it and took notes on it, God brings us to a trial. God will bring us to suffering. God will bring us to the valley of the shadow of death. And it's in the valley of the shadow of death that we learn who he is. And it's during that time of testing that we realize he is who he says he is. And I don't understand it fully. But when the other side of that furnace, on the other side of that valley, on the other side of that trial, we emerge. And it's not mama's faith, it's my faith. It's not just the pastor's faith, it's my faith. He's not just her shield and his shield, or his, her, his, her shield and his buckler. He's my shield and he's my buckler. He's not just uh, his strong tower. He's my strong tower because I had to climb it. He's my resource because I had to draw from it. He's my shelter in the storm because he's all I had when it came. And what God is trying to do in every one of our hearts, he's trying to engrave his truth, engrave his passion, engrave his purpose, and engrave his person on every heart in this room. And many times, the only way that can happen is by being in the furnace and going through the times of testing. I wanted to share a personal story here, but we don't have time. But I know there's been times in my life, and many of you may be able to relate to times in your life where, where you think, you thought you should have had it all figured out. You, you, you should have had the answers. You know, you just get to the point where you come to the end of yourself and you just don't know what to do. And God has shown us something there. He's showing something he can't show us any other way. There's, there's a place in this walk of life that we live in. There's a, a dark place, a tough place. There's a difficult place that becomes the sweetest place. It is there and then in that time that God begins to reveal things about his character and about his great grace and about his love and about his delivering power that you can't learn anyplace else. The pain is always productive. He said the testing produces. I walked a mile with gladness. She chatted all the way. I was none the wiser for all she had to say. But I walked a mile with sadness. Not a word, said she, but all the things I learned the day that sorrow walked with me. How do you keep a lemonade perspective on the lemons in your life? First, you have to adjust your expectations when, not if, the trials come. Secondly, know that the pain is productive or pro producing. Lastly, we have to value perseverance as gold. You've got to value perseverance. You know, the first fruit of the Spirit that God wants to instill in us is patience. A lot of people say it's love, but I believe that patience is, is the connecting point to love and all the other fruits of the Spirit. The first thing God wants to produce in our life is, according to what James is telling us, is, is patience or endurance. Why? Because it is patience, perseverance, long-suffering that is the connecting point. It's a direct link between our circumstances and our maturity. 
Patience is a direct link between your circumstances and your maturity. You see, God cares more about your maturity than he does about your ease. That's why Paul could say uh, things like, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, when we learn, when we can learn as, as, as believers that God is producing something and it's more valuable than gold, that is produce, that, that producing patience to the degree that we're, we're going to be made perfect. Because that's the ultimate goal. That's God's desire for us is to be brought to perfection. And, and so that we may be mature. The word mature there, that's what we're talking about. It's maturity and complete, lacking nothing. When, anybody ever gotten to the point where they're lacking nothing? No, we got a long ways to go. But that's what God is pushing us to. That's what he's trying to get us to is where we can get to the point where we're lacking nothing. And you got people like Paul in, in Romans 5, 3 and 4. He says, we glory in tribulations. Huh? We glory in tribulations. I excuse me, Paul, what did you say? We glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance produces character. How in the world can you say that, Paul? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, because our light and momentary afflictions, and this is the man who was, he was shipwrecked, he was imprisoned, he was kicked around, left to dead, he endured the sufferings of Jesus in his body, and he said, this light and momentary affliction is achieving an eternal glory of far greater worth. See, when we value maturity with patience as a connecting point, and, and, and begin to understand that as bad as our circumstances might get, our circumstances are not the enemy. They're a friend. And what you embrace as a friend ceases to be an enemy. I was, uh, I, I was in the military. I was in a ranger unit, um, 75th Ranger Regiment, several years ago. And these are just a bunch of nutcases. I'm just telling you, these guys are all just crazy people. And I, I feel like I might have matured out of that, I hope. But... The things that we enjoy doing are things that people usually would run away from. I mean, you, you had to enjoy something. That we, we, had a, we had a motto, we said. It originated in the regiment years ago, but it's kind of a contemporary saying now. They even wrote books on it. They got T-shirts, but it says, embrace the suck. See, we loved what people would call the suck, the things that are miserable. We loved it. We wanted to go into those areas that were just miserable, like the jungle, where there's microorganisms that will kill you and there's snakes that will kill you and there's all kinds of stuff that will kill you. The mudslides will kill you. The rain will drown out there. It's nuts in a triple canopy jungle. One day this Air Force plane was flying over and looking down, and it was pouring down rain, and looking down at this nasty mess over Nicaragua. And the Air Force guy turns to his friend. He goes, man, I bet it sucks down there. He said, yeah. Meanwhile, there were some Marines that were on a patrol down in that jungle. And then one Marine looked over at the other Marine and said, boy, it sucks down here. A few kilometers over, there was a team of rangers. You know what they said? Boy, I wish it sucked more down here. Because that was the mentality that they had. And what, what the rangers embraced as a friend wasn't their enemy. Everybody else would have looked at th Think about this. Think about somebody who loves to hunt versus somebody who doesn't. All the same reasons that that guy or that woman likes to get up in the morning before the sun comes up when it's freezing cold outside to go out into the woods, tromping around, getting twigs in your eyes in the pitch blackness, getting up in a tree stand, risking life, falling out of a tree stand, and sit there for hours and hours waiting on a deer to come by. The things that just excites this person so much about the hunting experience are the same reasons this person just wants to stay in the bed. Early morning, freezing cold, all those things. Because what we embrace as a friend ceases to be an enemy. And when you see that the pain is producing, that the trial is producing, and what God can do and he can produce in you, then it really does become like Joseph who was sold into slavery so that he could deliver Israel from the famine. And when he was confronted with his accusers, he had about one thing to say. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. We need to embrace the fact that it may not turn out like we want it to. It may be better. It may be worse. But just as long as I am mature in Christ and Christ is glorified in my testimony, that's all that matters. We can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and, 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 and a billy goat. They said, you have to bow to this idol. They say, we will not. If you don't bow, you're going to get thrown into the furnace. And they said, well, that's okay. We're not going to bow. And I tell you what, our God is big enough. Our God is strong enough. Our God is able to deliver us from the furnace. And if he doesn't, okay, we're still not going to bow. 
But guess what? They didn't bow and they didn't burn. And they saw a fourth man in the furnace they wouldn't have seen otherwise. There was a fourth man in that furnace. They never met him. And get this, they had a testimony on the other side of the furnace that they didn't have going in. They had a testimony on the other side of the furnace they didn't have going in. Even the man who wrote most of the New Testament, Paul, he said, I've seen things I can hardly communicate. God took me to the third heaven. I didn't even know there was three heavens. He said, God took me to the third heaven. I've seen stuff you can hardly imagine. It was so incredible that what God showed me that if it wasn't for God's grace, I would be a prideful man. In other words, I'd be so prideful, I couldn't even choose against it. That's how strong the temptation to be puffed up would be. But, but God, God provided a bed of roses and special grace to keep me in my place. No. He said that God in his mercy, God in his grace, God in his love, to keep me in my place, gave me a thorn. Paul, being the spiritual man that he was, seeing the higher end, he said, I beg God to take it away. I don't know about you, but I don't like thorns in my life. People ask all the time, what was Paul's thorn? I don't know. Some said he was sick. Some said he had eyesight problems. Some people said he got married. But uh, he said, I begged God three times to take it away. Three times being a, a symbolic of a, and as much as I could and of completion of fullness. I, I begged God to take it away, and I kept asking. But God said, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Well, what does that mean? When God decides to leave a thorn in your life and in my life, it's because the presence of that thorn is producing something better for his glory and our good than the removal of that thorn could ever produce. Jacob wasn't a great man of God until the great wrestling match. He was a liar. He was selfish, a conniver, until he wrestled with a pre-incarnate Christ through the night. And that's when he said this. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I don't know about you, but when I ask that prayer to God, you know, bless me, get my hip knocked out of joint, and it, it just, just doesn't come to mind. I mean, it's way back on the list. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God touches his inner thigh, his hip pops out of joint, and he was no longer called Jacob from that day forward, which meant deceiver. He was called Israel, one who strives with God. And I can just imagine old Jacob as an old man, a young boy coming up to him, Father Jacob, What's the matter with your leg? Why, why have you hobbled all these years? Why can't you walk right? And Jacob looked back with a twinkle in his eye and said, son, because one day a long time ago, I asked God to bless me, and he did. Not the way I expected, but he did. And you know, every sweet, seasoned, humble, precious, meek saint of God that I've ever met, just about all of them that had the air of Jesus about them, nine out of ten times, there was a limp somewhere. They'd been through a trial, and they could speak of things of the Lord that they could not otherwise. So as we go into 2022, the good news is, yes, troubles are coming, but the great news is we can allow, if we adjust our perspective, allow those struggles to produce maturity in each one of us, and we can know that there's a bigger picture going on in our lives. Dave Lane used to say this. I, I've stole it from him. I love it. You'd ask him how he was doing, and he would say, big picture? Great. Insinuating small pictures, there's problems. Big picture, man, we are, we are believers in Jesus. We have eternity in heaven, and, and, and God is working in and through us. That's big picture. Little picture, there's struggles, there's fires, there's furnaces, there's difficulties. But if we have the right perspective going in 2022, forget about all the other New Year's resolutions. Commit to a perspective of God working in us in every way, shape, form that he needs to, to get us to a place of maturity. If you can, will you stand with, with me this morning? I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you guys as we go out our last Sunday in 2021, and we face another year, a new beginning. Father, you are so wonderful. You are so gracious. You are so good to us that despite the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world, despite the fact that all the struggles and trials would come on us regardless, you've allowed those things into our lives to make us better, to make us stronger. Give us strength, Lord, not to become bitter or to turn away from you when, when the trials come. 
but help us to be strong. I pray for these folks here this morning. I pray for Edgewater Alliance Church and the ministries, and I pray that as we go from this place that we will go and become the usable church that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Happy New Year. Thank you for tuning into this resource. Hopefully, it was a blessing to your life and faith. For more information about the church or to partner with us financially, you can go to edgewateralliance.org. And if you're in town, come check out one of our services on Sunday morning. Uh, But whether you are watching online or here in person, may you live like Jesus wherever you live, work, and play. Blessings.